the river axe is of national significance. It's designated a special area of conservation and a triple SI. The river axe is designated for its unusual plant communities that are typical of clear waters. It's got water crowfoot and water starwort. But the axe is not a chalk stream. It's got much more mixed geology. And as a result, it's very diverse. Uh, in, in the lower reaches in particular, it's slow flowing with deep pools and shallows. The river is it's part of our culture, really. And I think we all want it to be in good shape. And when you look at it, it just looks muddy and polluted. Our monitoring shows that the river is poor and in many areas it is continuing to deteriorate. We need to work with farmers on the River Axe to bring the river back to favourable condition. It doesn't make any difference how far away the farm is from the watercourse. It, ultimately, it will end up in the watercourse. It, if, if surfaces are compacted, uh, overland flow can travel a long way until it, until it gets into a watercourse. So it doesn't matter how far away farms are. Our modelling has shown that farming is responsible for 70% of the phosphates and sediment pollution and intensive dairy we've identified as being the largest cause of this. The land management has changed drastically in the catchment uh, over recent decades. The intensification of the dairy farms means that uh, tractors and machinery are on the land a lot more than what they used to be and a lot of the soils in the Yarty catchment are a high clay content, which means that they're very vulnerable to compaction. And once they're compacted, they generate a lot of runoff, very little rainfall is allowed to percolate through the soil. What we've got now, because of the state of the land, is wash off, okay? And the wash off, the first problem with wash off is the volume of water. So if it's not soaking into the ground, it's all coming off at once. So you've got this load of water, one go, blasting everything out as it goes down the valley. And so that to me is the biggest problem, blasting out all the habitats. But at the same time, it's taking with it all the stuff that's on the land. And so at the tail end of the spate event, all that mud and phosphorus and nutrient and dung gets deposited and it get deposited in the backwaters, in the gravels. And so the gravels are now behaving like an enriched field. Certain things thrive on that, and the sensitive plants don't, and so it just becomes like a, a muddy pond. And you can see a lot of algae in the river, and that is a result of a lot of nutrient in the river. We get to the springtime and the air temperature starts to warm up and the water temperature starts to warm up because the sun is getting higher in the sky and the daylight hours are getting longer and it just, with the extra nutrient, it just encourages that algae to grow more and it just smothers everything. Since 2016, we've had a project um, ongoing in the River Axe, an agricultural regulatory project where Environment Officer, the project officer, has been out visiting yeah, the most 125 yeah. most intensive dairy farms on the River Axe. Yeah. And we've been focusing on farm infrastructure um, to begin with, so primarily slurry storage and silage storage. So we're finding 95%, up to 95% of farms are not compliant. So things we're focusing on are the impact of intensive dairy, the impact of maize production, um, the impact of winter spreading in the catchment and the runoff and the phosphates lost from the land from that. From an initial visit from the Environment Agency where we would make an assessment with the farmer of what they have and their current state of compliance. If they're found to be not compliant, we would draw up a, a plan to move them into compliance. This may involve new slurry store, but it might be that it might just need clean water separation. 
might need yards being covered. Um, we work closely with catchment sensitive farming who are able to offer grants for some of this work. So we would look at finding the most efficient way to become compliant, but we would be clear that you need to become compliant and we expect to see progress against that. If that progress isn't being made, that is when we would look at regulation and enforcing those improvements. All farms need to have a minimum of four months slurry storage to comply with the SAFO regulations. I first came to Blindmill Farm uh, back in 2018. Uh, when I inspected the farm, it was non-compliant for silage storage uh, and also very borderline for slurry storage too. After a discussion with John, we realised the slurry pit, we were inadequate in the amount of slurry storage we had. We sort of knew it and we knew we were going to have to do something at some point, but weren't quite sure which way to, to, way to go. And one of the options that we considered was to roof over the silage clamps to stop all the rainwater from going into Henry's slurry store. We talked through it. I pointed Henry uh, in the direction of the countryside stewardship mid-tier scheme uh, and told him to contact his local catchment sensitive farming officer. I also made a referral to catchment sensitive farming to uh, help Henry assist his application. So Henry made a, made a decision to increase his slurry storage. We looked at dirt bank stores, we looked at tin tanks and we looked at concrete. Uh, we, in the end we decided on concrete, partly through convenience of where it was on the farm, but also through cost of, of, of to store extra water. This farm now is a really good farm. It, uh, it meets all the regulations. Uh, not just the SAFO regulations, but the farming rules for water regulations too. And we've gone from a very sort of conventional type farm, growing maize, whole crop and grass, to a completely grass-based farm on a rotationally grazing system. And it's, it's simplified the farm and it's made, it, made the farm easier to manage. It's a very simple way of farming now and it's, 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 it's more profitable because of it. You can keep 100 cows on three acres you just have to import all the fodder and you have to export all the slurry. The thing that's going to change that, uh, the density of cows and how much slurry you produce and the available land bank is going to be the farming rules for water. The problem is going to be as farmers keep applying slurry, the pea indices in the soil is going to start to increase and they won't be able to justify an agronomic need for the phosphate because it's not being used up by the crop fast enough. So we'll end up with farms of a soil P indices of fours and fives, uh, and that's not good. But some farms are forward thinking and have already thought of this problem where they're seeing their P indices creep up on the soil and they've purchased slurry separators uh, and the slurry separators are taking out the the fibrous or the solid part of the slurry. Okay, so the cows are um, cubicle, cubicle housed, uh, scraped with a tractor and scraper into slats. They then go through channels to a reception pit where it's um, separated. The liquid waste goes to a slurry tower that is covered with an ammonia lid on it. And it's, it's a very successful way of containing ammonia within the slurry. And then because we umbilical pump it away and spread it with a dribble bar, we apply it to the crops and hopefully grow more crops rather than them apply it to the atmosphere. The farming rules for water that came in in 2018 is, is a very powerful piece of legislation. When you've got bare land and it's compacted, you get runoff. And the rules basically say if you get runoff causing soil erosion and mud entering rivers, it's against the law. So when you get muddy runoff greater than a, a hectare, that it would be an offence under the farming rules for water. Uh, but the weather is not an excuse, but there might be mitigating circumstances if it's a wet time and crops need to be harvested. So we would aim to be reasonable, proportionate, in our response. The way we deal with it is each case is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. It all depends on circumstance and context and history. 
Maize is a fantastic feedstuff for feeding cows. So as a farmer and nutritionist, maize is great. Historically, I think because maize is such a good feedstuff, people have grown it in stupid places. We have to learn the lessons of the past and I think be more careful and more thoughtful about where we grow it. If you cannot guarantee that when you grow maize that it is going to be grown safely without causing pollution, then it needs to be deemed as unacceptable in the catchment to grow it. We started off growing maize to push yields on cows. We realised we've got away from that. 2012 completely finished us when we grew a very small amount of maize. We're too high here, it's too, too wet, and it just doesn't work. And we were pushing fields back, back into the fields, compaction, all the problems it was causing. And I said, never again in 2012. I wouldn't ever want to go back to maize. We actually find cow health has actually improved since we've stopped growing maize. Are there too many cattle for the land bank that's available? So both specifically for one farm unit, but also for the axe as a whole. Does the herd size need to decrease? Do we need to stop growing maize if we're going to reach the targets? With climate change, we believe the impacts are only going to get more extreme, more intense rainfall, you know, longer, drier periods. Farming needs to adapt and change on the river axe to become sustainable so, it, so the environment is protected. We will always prefer to work with people, giving advice and offering guidance, but we do expect the regulations to be complied with and we will regulate if required. We're looking at a five-year time frame to see improvement. We're working, continue working with catchment sensitive farming and we're also working with uh, NFU, FWAG and other partners to look at support for farmers in the axe catchment. The key message from the Environment Agency to farmers in the river axe catchment is to be 100% compliant with the environmental legislation. If our monitoring shows that this isn't happening, then we will look at the possibility of implementing a water protection zone to further protect and improve the river axe.